Welcome to Riga, in the heart of the main hard drive of Latvia, the National Library. As the safekeeper and carrier of knowledge and information, it serves for exactly the same purpose as your laptop. To communicate, to learn and share, and most importantly, to pass on and inspire the next generations to create new insight. This is what the source code of Latvia looks like. For the next two days, it will be shaped, updated, and upgraded in a very special and European way. Hundreds of different inspirational thoughts, ideas, innovations, and digital strategies regarding the environment, employment, agriculture, science, business, learning, health, culture, media, and more will be shared and gathered from more than 28 different European countries with one common goal, to create one Europe. One digital single market and one unique code, code of today's digital Europe. Welcome to Digital Assembly 2015. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vivian Parry, and I'm absolutely delighted to be with you for this, the fifth digital assembly in this magnificent building. Now, it's being co-organized with the Latvian presidency of the Council of the EU and the European Commission, and the main purpose is to present and launch the digital single market strategy. And of course, to hear from you, the stakeholders. We'll come to you again in a little moment, but first, well, E-government ambassadors, they come in many forms, but in Latvia, they come in a very particular form. Now, there is a district of uh, Latvia, Suitu, and there, women, and let me just say women in the prime of their age, will sing for you, made up on the spot, a song in celebration of anything you like, your mother-in-law, your bride, your future girlfriend, or even, yes, e-government. And so, could I welcome now, Sweetu Sivas on the stage. <laughs> so, e-government ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, they have a Facebook page, and I think you're very good at the internet, is that right? Yes. <laughs> Marvellous. Off you go. Next stop, the Eurovision contest, and DG Connect, I think you found a secret weapon. So, uh, let me just take you through a bit of uh, housekeeping. Now, this session is being web streamed live, so hello if you're listening on the web stream down to you, and hello also if you're in the listening room, and we also have uh, signing uh, for those uh, who have problems with accessibility, and we also have a speed, very speedy uh, texter who is putting up our proceedings. There is uh, a hashtag, of course, uh, and it's uh, up there, hashtag DA15EU. And can I introduce to you our Twitter meister, Jakob? Jakob, stand up and take a bow. 
Uh, he will be coordinating all the tweets. And on that point, I should say, ladies and gentlemen, put your phone on silent, please. But don't turn it off, because we'd really, really like you to tweet. So uh, the Wi-Fi access, in case you'd like that, is up there. Uh, I have to tell you, for the fire reasons, that there are two exits to the room at the back there. And the other thing I need to tell you is that quarter to four, there will be a coffee break. But ladies and gentlemen, it will be very brief, because you need to be back here by four. So. Having been uh, very bossy, uh, let me just tell you a bit more about you, the audience. So there are 540 of you. Uh, there are 38% of you who are women. I'm very glad to see that, because often in these digital events, women are not as uh, represented as perhaps they ought to be. I'm also very glad to say that there are a lot of you under 35, so nearly a quarter of you are under 35, which makes us, all of those who are slightly older, um, slightly older, very glad because you are the future of digital. Um, one extraordinary thing about what you all, 35% of you share your name with someone else in the audience. So that can be a game you can play over coffee. Right. So, uh, let me now introduce the formal part of the proceedings, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome the Latvian Prime Minister, Lamidoto Strauma. And uh, I can tell you that, as a maths graduate, she always had a particular interest in informatics. She's had responsibility in previous governments for digital. And, of course, with the Latvian presidency, she was a natural supporter of the digital single market during the Latvian presidency. Prime Minister. Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, I am pleased to welcome all of you in Riga and address the participants of the Digital Assembly organized by the Latvian Presidency and the European Commission. This event is held in the premises of the Latvian National Library. We hold, call this library the Castle of Light, connected by high-speed internet links with more than 800 libraries through, throughout Latvia. Our Castle of Light keeps and safeguards knowledge and information. It is a symbol of information and the knowledge society. Ladies and gentlemen, today representatives from all over the Europe meet here to share their views on how to achieve a common digital market, a single market. Of course, the digital single market itself is not the final goal. The fi uh, final goal of any policy is to make life better for our people. Hence, the challenge is to put the right policies in place to build a better Europe in digital age. This is an approach which shaped the agenda for the Latvian presidency of the Council. Our three teams, competitive, digital and engaged Europe, are built around delivering real benefits for people. Competitive Europe for the Latvian presidency means focusing on jobs, growth, and investment. Digital Europe means to help businesses and consumers to trans transform Europe into the world's leading knowledge-based economy. Engaged Europe for us means to deliver security and prosperity for Europe and our neighbors. And the concept of digital single market ties these aspects together since it is at most precondition to the competitive Europe, and it can only be achieved if everybody is engaged. Ladies and gentlemen, Digital Assembly is a culmination of Latvia's digital presidency. There are two more weeks to go, and we will continue to work with passion and dedication until the last minute of our presidency. 
but already now we can be proud of results achieved. Let me mention some. On connected continent regulation, we are very close to reaching the final compromise, which will put and trooming surcharges and introduce the first open internet rules for the whole European Union. Likewise, we expect the next trilogue to be the final one on Network Information Security Directive. It will establish legal basis for cooperation between member states in cybersecurity. And we have reached a general approach on the data protection regulation. It will establish common principles for legal, justified, and transparent data processing within EU. The presidency had invested significant efforts to finalize this, the discussion in the Council, what have been ongoing for almost three and a half years. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not only legislation that will bring us to digital Europe. We have to embrace digital mindset. Therefore, Latvian presidency is a strong supporter of the digital by default principle. It requires digital transformation of every sector and, sector and policy area, area. And it requires digital thinking within minds of each political leader, employer, and civil servant. We will not reach a truly digital Europe without digital transformation of the economy. In doing so, we should not be afraid of changes. On the contrary, Europe should lead the digital transformation. It is the only way to stay competitive on the global scale. We tend to protect our traditional businesses against the new business models, such as, uh, such as sharing economy, but protection will only make our companies weaker and more, more vulnerable against, against global competition. Instead, we should spend more energy on creating the right conditions for the growth of European digital startup companies and for innovative ways to apply digital technologies to sectors where Europe has traditionally been strong. If we manage to do so, Europe will, once again, be the world's leading knowledge-based economy and be the place where most innovations are born. Ladies and gentlemen, but first we must overcome digital fragmentation in Europe. G digital single market is about removing barriers which do not allow us to fully exploit the great potential of European consumer market the biggest consumer market in the world. Therefore, I would like to express my appreciation to the European Commission and personally to Vice President Tansip, sorry <laughs> that is, he is not here, and Commissioner Ottinger for the timely release of the digital single market strategy and express my confidence that it will give new impetus to rapid completion of the digital single market. Since its publication in the 6th of May, Latvian presidency has arranged ministerial debates on the strategy in several council formations. The feedback received from ministers clearly shows broad support to the digital single market strategy. It is seen as a good instrument to facilitate completion of the digital single market. But the publication of the strategy is just the beginning. The swift advice implementation of it will be the key of our uh, success. We have to be wise, especially regarding regulation. Our, our life changes at much faster pace than legislation. It calls for future proof and flexible regulation, because fixed rules can be counterproductive. 
The implementation of the strategy will not be easy. Referring to Vice President Tansip, it will be an uphill struggle. To be successful in this struggle, leadership is the key. Europe and each member state need leaders who are truly interested in Europe's digital transformation and who are determined to bring forward the necessary changes. Another precondition for the effective implementation of the strategy is good coordination, both within each member state, between member states, and between the Council and the, the Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that Assembly will provide the opportunity for inclusive, future-oriented discussions on the development of the digital single market. Member States, EU institutions, academia, industry and citizens' representatives should participate in order to bring the digital single market to the level of, of ambition needed to respond to the existing economic and social challenges. It is the mid of June, a few days before Latvia's most important national holiday, midsummer uh, celebrations named Ligua, shortest night and the longest day. According to the tradition, the light must be not fade at night. Therefore, Latvians burn fires and sing from sunset till next morning to acquire power and fertility and God's blessing so that we have good harvest from the seeds sown in spring. Hence, it is a good time to celebrate a new beginning based on stable foundation. The publication of the digital single market strategy in its broad sense can be compared with the seeds sown and the digital assembly, the celebration to expect for good harvest. I wish us all productive and fruitful discussions and nice stay in the Riga. Best wishes to everybody. Thank you. Prime Minister, thank you so much for those very powerful words. And uh, thank you to the Latvian presidency because you have made such a difference to this digital strategy. Let us now welcome Robert Madelin, who's Director General of DG Connect to the stage. Robert. So, Prime Minister, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me enormous pleasure uh, to be able to thank the Latvian Presidency for hosting this inaugural session around the digital single market here in Riga and here in this extraordinary auditorium. It's my pleasure, thanks to the Latvian uh, government's organization to have been speaking here on some future occasions and I really would encourage those of you who haven't been here before to, to get a sense of the building. But I think, Prime Minister, for, for yourself, for your ministers, and if you allow me for Anis uh, Daugoulis, with whom I've worked very closely during these six months, uh, Latvia, as the presidency of the council, has helped us enormously to begin building momentum around a digital single market goal, one of President Juncker's top 10 priorities for this uh, commission mandate. And today and tomorrow, I think the challenge for us is to work out how best to build further that momentum. The, the first thing I would like to pick up, and the Prime Minister has spoken to it already, is the need for speed. Uh, Commissioner Ertinger, who uh, will be able to join us tomorrow, and Vice President Ansip, although he's not able to join us uh, today and tomorrow, both agree on one thing, which is that if the world is evolving at internet speed, uh, public policy has to at least accelerate. And as the Prime Minister has also shared, a lot of political pressure does not always produce equivalent speed in the European processes, and we suffer in this poker game to finalize legislation. So the big challenge we face, I think, in the next 18 months 
to get proposals on the table, but then in the next, I would say, three years to begin to see uh, real progress in the council with member states showing political uh, guidance and making compromises and also in the parliament. So the need for speed is one thing we must definitely bear in mind. The second, I would argue, is the need for innovation and reform. You won't get new world tools for the European Union without new thinking on the part of us all. Uh, already last week in the Open Innovation Summit in ESPO, which President Makulu will speak about, we were trying to work out how does a digital single market and the route to new innovation in a digital age fit together. You can't do innovation in the data age in the way that we did it in the machine age. And this is an important challenge which we haven't yet cracked in every university, in every town in Europe. So making things happen innovatively and welcoming the new is a huge challenge, I think, both for technocratic planning, but also for society. And watching the three ladies and listening to them sing, it seems to me personally that the big secret to success in innovation is for us both to embrace the new and to see how it can fit with our roots. And this is a, a sense of optimism and commitment which not every one of the 507 million European citizens feels in their hearts today. So I would say after speed, a sense of optimistic innovation is the second challenge. The third, I would argue, is to put together the pieces of a puzzle where every European can win in a better digital world. Digital skills for everybody was the uh, focus of the pre-summit workshop this morning. We were able to see Belgium and Cyprus launching new national coalitions and to welcome on board the alliances already existing from the UK and the Netherlands. So I think that we begin to see a recognition that in a new age, new skills are needed. What we lack still is that every region, every city, every school, every university knows they have to be part of meeting that challenge. So skills is a must. The, the second, I think, imperative, and already Vivienne spoke to it, is to get the balance right. You can't sit in a room like this with people as old as me on average and still make policy for the future. 40% of women in the room is better than 20%, uh, but it's still not 50-50. And I think that the, the, the youth of the digital age need to be given a stronger, louder voice and role than they have today. The third element of success is being relevant locally. Europe is a sort of big distant thing, and I think that part of the reason that we welcome the President's invitation to work here and not in Brussels and Strasbourg and Luxembourg for once is that we need to get out more. My colleagues and I will be visiting every member state capital since the 6th of May through to the end of September, trying to get out more. But I think that if every city wants to be smart, if the regions, the Committee of Regions, the Economic and Social Committee are also part of our alliance, then we can win. And finally, language. It's, it was again a summit under this presidency in this town which said one of the things you need is a multilingual digital single market. Many people speak the language I'm speaking at the moment. I was born speaking it, thank you to my mother. But we can't assume that Europe can win in the world if we want everybody to speak one or other European language, but we're not able to give each other the opportunity to transact in the digital single market in their mother tongue. So we've talked about a cloud for Europe, a cloud for science, and I think we're beginning now, uh, next week in Brussels, already before the end of the Latvian presidency, to discuss a cloud for language. It seems to me that when we can render the digital single market accessible to citizens by giving them the skills, by welcoming everybody, by putting language skills on the front end of what we see over the internet, we can begin to build something very special for Europe. So for me personally, this is an exciting moment because I think we're about to try and build a new sort of castle of light for Europe. And I hope in the next two, two days that we'll get a lot of insights here because 
Uh, this is probably now the tallest building in the city, and from this building today and tomorrow, we can see the future of Europe. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Robert, as ever, so insightful and thoughtful. Now, you heard Robert allude to the uh, ESPO conference uh, that was held uh, just earlier this month in Finland. And would you now welcome Marku Markula to the stage? Uh, Marku has actually been at that conference. It is going to uh, report back for us on its uh, outcome. Um, your Royal Highness, your Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, um, I was really asked uh, to um, kind of tell a bit about the story about what we did in ESPO in our both the innovation camp, open innovation camp, but that linked to the two-day open innovation 2.0 conference organized by the Commission jointly with many many other providers. But it's, uh, I think it's just too fair to start that most likely close to everyone here, we can agree that digitalization means industrial revolution. And not just uh, revolution in traditional industries, but throughout our societies. And uh, this uh, digitalization, it modifies business models, value chains, networks. Digitalization and innovation, they really go hand in hand. And that's why I'm bringing these messages here, so that just to challenge everyone to participate and to be more of this movement. I've taken here uh, um, a few slides uh, about our COR priorities, and I want just to move on to the first one. What does this uh, growth mean in reality? Where do we get the growth? It's a bottom-up movement, as we have defined in our priorities of the regions and cities for the next uh, five-year period. It's integrating entrepreneurial spirit uh, with functioning digital single market and as well regional smart specialization strategies. And uh, we have defined, taken there a few of the kind of measures where we want to challenge uh, our, not just the cities, but uh, citizens especially to move on. There are a few of those highlights which we then need to move to concrete measures, and that's what we uh, took there. We worked uh, with the innovation camp already going back two years to Dublin when the city of Dublin uh, was hosting the EU Open Innovation 2.0, the first conference with a mission to develop a widespread innovation literacy in Europe. That's what we're actually challenging now as well, our libraries to make a new role for them to change. So it's, they are the hotspots of innovation. They are the places where uh, learning uh, comes a reality, learning for everything. And uh, this Dublin Declaration, it included uh, 10 concrete uh, kind of focus areas, and we followed that further on in the process that we had there in ESPO the beginning of June. And it's uh, really using digitalization, a lot of uh, tweets, and as well a lot of face-to-face -face meetings and people committing for their kind of joint efforts to come. We uh, went to concrete uh, action plans, kind of uh, eight action fronts for realizing open innovation in 2.0, this kind of step to experimenting, piloting, rapid prototyping, sharing the process and sharing the outcomes. These are, uh, now there are the kind of uh, focus areas and uh, within each of those, we have now groups of volunteers from around Europe to move that in uh, concrete measures jointly with different organizations. But in many cases, it was as well with their own cities or their own uh, universities, their own small, smart, uh, fo smart city-focused uh, companies operating on those. Um, I'll just highlight a few as a kind of examples. 
but already showing on that, that with these eight focus areas, we had there uh, uh, each of them focusing on some concrete measures, how to organize with these regional smart specialization strategies, piloting partnerships to increase Europe's uh, uh, renewable capital, how to use the virtual and physical platforms for experimenting with and improving bottom-up collaboration, how to stimulate, enable citizens as initiators and active participants of innovative projects, how to find New, new forms for training, mobilizing people within these open innovation skills for practical projects at the level of society. And taking into the elements that were here today, this morning, in this digital skills uh, process, what was organized as part of this conference, and so on. So uh, take number six there, how to involve uh, all quadruple helix actors, quadruple meaning moving from traditional university, business, uh, city collaboration to take more of the citizens on board on that. As end users, but as well people who create, who have a cr crucial role in the innovation as a process itself. Uh, we went on and how to do this experimenting and prototyping. I have here a few slides showing on so that during uh, the camp itself, these uh, activities, these uh, few slides come from the camp itself, how uh, small eight to 10 person teams work on with innovative mindset. We were hosted uh, by a camping site in the National Park of Espo, just uh, 25 kilometers out from the Helsinki downtown. And we had some uh, uh, visualizers making short uh, drawings out of these as well. And taking here as an example so that we are challenging the uh, Joint Research Center with its S3 platform and together with Committee of the Regions to organize certain piloting partnership processes to have these pilots for scaling about integrating decision makers, pioneering ecosystem initiatives. We already identified several of, of those. In concrete terms, I was as well participating in the uh, the uh, annual uh, Baltic Sea Strategy Forum in Jurmala two days ago, jointly with the Prime Minister of Latvia, Strom Juma, and she challenged us, the participants as well, to think more about these innovation hubs. So I took the message along immediately yesterday to Potsdam Brandenburg in Germany, and there we created with their teams already what could it mean to be in uh, uh, the network of innovation hub uh, as part of the Baltic Sea strategy. And that's what we can now take further on with this uh, joint research center. So how to move on, on in Europe in general. Uh, take the next uh, 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 concrete uh, move ahead uh, uh, dimension, this front number two. Uh, we already have uh, three cities from three different countries that are ready to cooperate on a new collaborative platform for collecting ideas for new European initiatives and connecting people with relevant knowledge, expertise, resources and energy. And among those is, is uh, uh, the presidency country uh, of next spring, uh, Netherlands and their city of Amsterdam. And so we've already started with several of their people how to move on, how to link this development to the urban agenda, which is one of the hot priorities of the, uh, of the Dutch presidents. We moved as well, so what is the role of citizens as innovators? And again, there are a lot of kind of details in these uh, nice visualized uh, drawings, as well the other material provided on the virtual reality map. So, and how to take this kind of quantum uh, learning spaces, which can be as a good uh, focus is the role of libraries. So definitely linking that to what I, I'm quite convinced we'll hear more today as, as well. So why societies need to open up more to engage uh, all people, not just uh, uh, those most talented ones, but to be really the hotspot for collaboration. 
And what I want to convince that this needs to be a process. It's not anymore just uh, separate uh, conferences, separate seminars, but we've already drafted there along with the Committee of the Region. So what can we implement within, within the next years? And look, uh, especially our uh, members, 350 members, regional mayors, city mayors, city ministers, etc., to take the lead on this, so kind of move this uh, thinking so that we have the Europe 2020 strategy, but we need to encourage much more on this kind of bottom-up movement, getting people on board. And uh, I uh, sum up this so that taking kind of the ball back to me, myself, as the president of the Committee of the Regions. So what can we do? We need to do our share as well. And our target is to encourage this bottom-up engagement and innovation. And that means that in concrete terms, we will experiment this question, how to orchestrate the support to open innovation 2.0 actors, those focusing especially on smart cities. But we want to stress that it, it needs to be really smart human cities, smart, uh, sustainable cities. So their sustainability in human uh, behaviors, human uh, mindset, that's crucial on this. And this means that we need to create these measures to support the EXO ESPO action process, as well as the Europe's pioneering cities and regions and their stakeholders. So huge number of potential exist. And with the full attention of regions uh, of opportunity, the kind of, uh, uh, let's say, Central European, uh, Eastern European regions, which really have a lot of potential. Many of them have already convinced that they want to be innovation builders, not just to say that, okay, they are the, some of those are the less developed regions, but take the momentum, take the mindset of being innovation builders. And this also means really shaking hands or going hands in, hand in hand uh, and creating new uh, forms of collaboration between uh, the Committee of the Regions, our members, and the Commission, DG Connect, definitely, DG Region, definitely, DG Research, many others, and especially what is the role of Joint Research Center of EU, so that that needs to support the political decision making, so that has a crucial role to play. And that's where I'm challenging as well you as representatives of different organizations, different cities, different regions, different stakeholders to move on and take action. It's really time more to have this kind of experimenting and piloting instead of making plans and plans and plans again. Thank you very much. Well, Robert Madeleine was calling for speed, and if I may say so, I think, sir, you are showing uh, that you are motoring ahead uh, there. Uh, so, uh, let me now come to uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Laurentine of the Netherlands. Very appropriate that we should be hearing from her in this very fine uh, library. She's chair of the Reading and Writing Foundation and uh, the UNESCO uh, Special Envoy on Literacy for Development. Uh, Your Royal Highness. Madam Prime Minister, Your Excellencies, dear friends, it's a tremendous joy for me to be here back in the Latvian uh, Public Library. I was here at the opening only a number of months ago, and it's always energizing to come here. And I have to say, it puts a smile on my face every time I've been looking at the news and seeing that a public library is the backdrop of so many excellent meetings over the last six months of the EU presidency of Latvia. Now, I'm also excited to be here at the Digital Assembly, and I really thank the Commission and for the Latvian presidency to invite me here today. And I really do see this as a springboard, I would call it, to bring together seemingly different worlds who we think are separate, but maybe are not so separate. And what I believe in bringing together these worlds is a willingness to think beyond different policy silos. Now, what's my perspective? And I realize that's only one perspective on life, is that I believe that we should think perhaps from the perspective of people 
who, after all, do not live in silos. And more specifically, to think from the perspective of millions of people whose lives are not like yours and mine. They are fundamentally different in how people have been raised. You and I, we may think in terms of connectivity, of opportunity, and the next big thing. But perhaps we should remember that for tens of millions of people, ordinary Europeans getting to that stage is an extraordinary journey. And that we have to remember that it may take many more steps than we think between the world of offline and the world of online. Together, you and me, we're in a position to make them feel included too. And actually, we need all of those millions of citizens. So I'd like to take on, put on my glasses. Today I had a wonderful a giraffe glasses that made me uh, look like a giraffe. Um, uh, I will recommend you going into the uh, demo center where I was in this virtual world. I'd like to put on two lenses, one with roots and one about the wings, as I just discussed with the UNESCO representative. And what it turns, what it takes to take those lenses and turn them, in, turn them into one holistic integral glasses. First, about the wings, your world of the digital connectivity. I quote from something that you're very familiar with, no doubt. The internet and digital technologies are transforming the lives we lead, the way we work. These changes are happening at a scale and speed that bring immense opportunities for innovation, growth, and jobs. Now, of course, you immediately recognize this from the European Commission's digital single market strategy. I love this digital world precisely because of the opportunities it brings. I work in the field of literacy. I work in the field of libraries. I work with young people, with children. I am the biggest fan of this digital world. And just like a fan once does when they meet their favorite movie star, let me quote three sentences from that uh, digital uh, strategy. A digital single market can create opportunities for new startups and allow existing companies to grow and profit from the scale of a market of over 500 million people. And another quote, a digital economy can also make society more inclusive. Citizens and businesses are not currently getting the full benefits from digital services from e-government, e-health, e-energy, e-transport that should be available seamlessly across the EU. And finally, another quote, new technologies can modernize public administration, achieve cross-border interoperability, and face e facilitate easy interaction with citizens. I would say, fantastic. Great ambitions that you and I share as they aim to provide the necessary opportunities for all Europeans. But perhaps that is the question. Is this really about all Europeans? So I turn my other lens and I talk about the roots, the roots of Europe. And as I'm reading these sentences, I have to say, I feel rather uncomfortable about looking at these ambitions through those one lens and looking at them in isolation, knowing that they forego what I believe is the full reality of Europe. I'm not sure you realize, but that there's one in five Europeans. The world is hard to read. And what does that mean in practice? It means that they lack the basic reading and writing skills to fully and independently participate in society. And I have to tell you, I've been working with these groups of people who are fairly similar in their emotions and in their life experiences from all over the world. The impact of low literacy skills on somebody's lives is unimaginable. It's enormous. Most of the people are born and bred in Europe, in their home countries. So you can imagine that their sense of shame 
is deeply ingrained in how they look at life and how they feel life looks at them and people around them looks at them. They're hiding a secret. And they go through life stressed, unable to read safety instructions at work, and take the wrong medication and so on. You get the sense. It's tremendously disabilitating. Underneath that, because I can immediately hear you think, ah, this is about skills. But there's something much deeper about people growing up with that. And that's people growing up with a lack of sense of self-worth. So you can imagine that if people grow up like that, and I would invite you to imagine a life like that, where everybody says around you from the age of very young, you're dumb, you don't participate, you sit in the back of the class. Those are the people, but that's extra, extraordinary, ordinary citizens. That your world of the digital revolution is very distant to them. And that for them, getting connected is a long and often painful journey of a thousand steps. They first have to overcome their sense of shame and isolation. They then have to find the courage to seek help. They then have to take a step to actually get those skills that we need, and so on and so forth. It's a thousand steps from offline to online. And I have to say that every time I speak with our language ambassadors who've gone through such painful journeys in life, I'm reminded to look at the world through their eyes. I would love to see a meeting with language ambassadors who've gone through life like that and your digital champions. Imagine that we then can look at the world with holistic lenses. So what is this world that I look and sketch out for you? What does it mean for your work and your ambitions? Perhaps we should look at the digital single market of 500 million people with more nuance, with more layers. That if we consider the one in five not inclined and able to use any of the new tools and services, we're talking about a market that's perhaps 20% smaller. So business here in the room have a clear interest to, to ensure that we have a fully literate society so that you can reach the consumers you want to reach. And governments themselves should have more nuanced, perhaps, nuanced views on what it takes to achieve their e-government ambitions. If for millions of people, digital processes are overwhelming, the savings that we calculate for going digital might actually be skewed. Only by also investing in helping people overcome the sense of shame and getting them to improve their basic skills will we actually make the savings that we desire to. Now, I'm not advocating that you put any of your digital single market ambitions on hold until Europe is fully literate. But I am saying, let's work hand in hand. Let's think of all the different steps that are needed to take the world into the offline, into the online. And this, by the way, we talk a lot about young people. All this is also about young people. So if this was your wake-up call, looking hopefully through different lenses now, let's talk action, perhaps even starting tonight. First, I'd like you to recommend you, to you some bedtime reading tonight. The final report of the EU um, high-level group of experts on literacy that I was, had an honor to chair under the guidance of the European Commission a few years ago. Now, this report breaks down all the various elements, including what it means for your um, side of the, uh, looking at the world, i.e. the digital skills, and looking at what needs to be done to bring those worlds together. For instance, about how reading online demands a greater ability to evaluate information critically than reading offline. And it may surprise you that digital learning methods offer great opportunities for people to acquire basic literacy skills. And the final pages of this report contain a grid of solutions where every stakeholder can look at what can I do to bring the world into an integrated society. Now, another action concerns a place like this, my favorite place, libraries. 
This library is not just a symbol of national pride. It's a way for people to connect, to learn. You've, I'm sure you've walked around, to feel included in their community and society at large. It's about making cities work, as the president of the Committee of the Regions just mentioned. There's no other place, I would say, anywhere that is more inclusive, that is more intimate and intimately connected to people's lives and safe for learning and development as public libraries. There are 65,000 public libraries around Europe. I believe that they're crucial in your strive to bring Europe into the digital age. They welcome 100 million citizens every year. They go there to seek jobs, they go there to make their startups, they go there for learning. It's a place for development. It's a free place that you can tap into if you find your way to this extraordinary resource. Now, another bedtime reading is this launch of the book Libraries Change Lives, which has an e-version as well. And basically what it does, it's hard statistics in this book, but it's also the library journeys or, or the journeys of people around Europe and what libraries have done for their lives. There is a website, libraryschangelives.eu, where you can find all these stories online. And finally, there is a solution that takes a little bit more work than some bedtime reading. Now, in the Netherlands, I've been raising awareness about the importance of literacy from about over a decade, and I've been happy to do it for many more. However, however, apart from the fact that people get tired of listening to me, I'd be happier that these speeches are just no longer possible, because I hope that in a few years' time, the more we connect, the more we look at the world through lenses that are brought together, society has actually internalized the need to identify and help people with low literacy skills. But to get to that point, you and I, we need to work together. So in the Netherlands, what we've done to take literacy or illiteracy from a non-issue right into the heart of the economic um, uh, uh, development of, the, uh, of society is to mobilize society, NGOs, businesses, governments, libraries, hospitals, we all need to think, reach out into the veins of society. And I guess that since all of the expertise that I've just mentioned is assembled in this room, I hope that you can take that forward. And my dream is to establish a new startup, a, basically a European hub that serves as a catalyst for this broad mobilization process in all member states. We have the case studies, we have the scalable solutions. Now we need what we call the wheeling and dealing to take this into the member states, together with NGOs, with businesses, and with governments. You are uniquely, I would say, uniquely positioned to see the opportunities of the digital world and to identify innovative solutions to overcome the obstacles blocking people from accessing those opportunities. I hope that through these short thoughts taken from the lives of extraordinary, ordinary citizens, together we can look at the world in a slightly different and holistic way, and to go and work together to strive towards a Europe where everyone has the basic reading and writing skills they need to have fully access to the opportunities of the digital single market. And Madam Prime Minister, you mentioned three words of your presidency. Competitiveness, digital, and an engaged Europe. And truly, those are the three components that if we want to take Europe to the next phase, that is what's needed. However, we can only make that happen if we look through one glasses with different colors. Thank you very much. She's, she's left. Actually, Your Royal Highness, I was hoping you might stay to answer a few questions. Uh, and that was a very compelling. And of course, literacy is uh, an extraordinary problem and one that swept under the carpet 
uh, very often. I, I was wondering first whether we had any questions from uh, Twitter on this. Twitter Meister? So I saw huge activity during, uh, during the last speech you know, on Twitter. People were quoting uh, Her Royal Highness, and, but there were no like exact questions asking exact um, you know, uh, questions. But uh, if I can sum up the tweets uh, into one question, I would maybe ask on behalf of all the people who are on Twitter, what can these people do who are, who are actively participating in our debates, in our conferences, in who are following the, the, the events which are happening uh, in, the, in this field, what can they do to, to, to make uh, the, your vision happen? So call to action there, what can individuals do? Well, perhaps I can use um, uh, one example of the tax authorities that we're working with. Um, in the Netherlands, and I'm sure that in many of the member states, there is a drive and a strive towards uh, getting people to fill on their tax forms online. Now, if you make a policy like that, and you do not take on the lens that I've just been describing, and forego the fact that there is one in five Europeans who don't have those skills, and not just skills, but what I just sketched out. If you just take that in and think, how would it be for people who are not even, not just connected, but who, are, who don't feel, who already feel that government is something very far and very scary, because it's big authority, and who then are need to do it online, you lose those people. And I think that you, and we work in the Netherlands with the tax authorities, to make sure that the measures that they put in, the way that they communicate with people to get them to fill in their tax forms online, is done in a way that you look at the world through their lenses. So it doesn't even require perhaps huge investments, it does, require that you look at the world from the perspective of what it would be not to know how to read and write. Very important point. Uh, can we have the lights up, just in case there were some questions from you uh, in the don't audience? Don't be shy. We're don't amongst be, friends. Do, do, um, is there anyone who has an experience that they'd like to share of good practice in uh, their country or how they're dealing with this problem? I have to say that when I'm faced with my tax return, it's not just my reading abilities that are challenged. <laughs> it's a complexity of the tax systems, but maybe we could... That's, that's too much of a, a, a big mouthful to swallow, changing the complete tax systems. Anyone Anyone with a question or a thought about this? Well, I think that you have uh, made your point so eloquently, and I'm sure people will want to take uh, what you've said away with them and think about it. Uh, it is an extraordinary problem, and one that uh, we would do very well not to forget. So, thank you very much, Your Royal Highness. Thank and you very much. we're now going to have a, a short break. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be very bossy and say that you have time literally to run out, grab a cup of coffee, swig it down and run back in again. So we start very promptly, ladies and gentlemen, at four. And thank you.